Hey, welcome to another software showcase. I'm Glenn Oliver, uh, Director of Program Management and Interns. Uh, we've seen some interns. And of course, with me as always is Mark Stedman, who is our Vice President of Information Technology, uh, leader and mentor extraordinaire. Uh, Mark, <laughs> who do we have joining us in the, sh in the showcase today? Thanks, Glenn, for the kind words. Glenn uh, is too embarrassed to mention that I always say he's also a great guy, so I'll say it for him. <laughs> but joining us today in the studio is another great guy, Matt Gerber, who uh, joined our team about a year and a half ago, right? Right. Matt, we are so glad that you're here today with us uh, for the Software Showcase, and we're also glad that you're on the team. So thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Matt's in here. Matt is our Director of Infrastructure and Support, and under that umbrella is also Digital Security for the organization. So Matt's got some great updates for us today, and we're gonna talk a little bit about digital security, the role that Matt's team and some contractors play in that, but also the role that our users play in that. So before we dive into that, Matt, why don't you just tell us a little bit about, little bit about yourself? Sounds good. I'm originally from Minnesota. My family and I moved down here about three years ago for a job at SpaceX, which was super exciting. They relocated us down here, so we live on Merritt Island, um, and then the Lord brought me here through one of our coworkers, actually, Tom. So happy to be here. Um, I think the Lord used SpaceX to bring my family to Florida so that I could work at Wycliffe Associates. So. Yeah, we'd like to thank Elon Musk for moving you here and saving WA that expense and also giving you the opportunity to become a really excellent and proficient mm. team member. Uh, what Matt's not telling you is that they had a they had a, a, a layoff. I'm sure I never could have stolen you away from SpaceX at the time, but the timing was amazing. We met you just a couple of days after you had gotten uh, released from there and I knew right away that you were going to be a great team member so glad that you're here. So Matt what are we going to start our digital security talking about today? What's our first topic? We are going to start talking about VPN which you may have heard of on radio advertisements or TV commercials but I'm going stand to for very private network? Very very private network. Okay. <laughs> yeah the better ones are the VVPNs. Okay. No, it stands for Virtual Private Network, and so I'm going to go over what exactly that is, so why you should be using it, where do you use a VPN, and how do you use a VPN. So Matt, before you dive into that, yeah. um, if everybody has done their Know Before annual training, which hopefully they have, our team did, mm -hmm. um, they do reference VPN a lot, and so we knew that it was important to not just have heard that you need VPN, but also to offer a VPN as well, so we're yes. going to get to that later, so this is just trying to telegraph why people should pay attention. Exactly. Cool. There's some action items for you at the end of this. Cool. All right, so just to go over some basics of how your computer connects to the internet, when you go to the news website or Facebook or whatever, your computer is sending out a bunch of packets, which is little pieces of information that have where it's going, what's inside of it, so your computer will send out a packet to ESPN or whatever with, I want to get this information, these sports scores, for example. And then ESPN's website will send a packet back, multiple packets, to your computer with the information. So this is a screenshot from a program called Wireshark, which is commonly used by network professionals to see what their computers are doing. So you can see here, this person went to ESPN, and then they also have Adobe on here, so they likely have Acrobat or some type of Adobe program open. But the point of showing this is there's a lot going on in the background. You might just think you're doing one thing, but your computer has multiple connections open simultaneously in the background. And your internet provider or the provider of the internet at the coffee shop or the airport can capture all of these and see exactly what you're doing. Right. And so a lot of passwords that get taken are from somebody watching what you're doing and they're just taking the packets out and they can see your password sometimes depending on how the encryption is set up. Or even just where you're going. Where So if I was somewhere that I didn't necessarily want to advertise that I work with Wycliffe, um, then that's, that's something that's broadcast out there. That's not good. Yeah, absolutely. So there's privacy from just people seeing your traffic and selling your habits to advertisers and also privacy like Glenn said if you're somewhere that you don't want an entity to know which websites or email service you're connecting to which could be a security risk. So the way that a VPN works is all of that data coming from your computer goes to one place it's a VPN server so somebody watching your connection all they're gonna see is all of your packets all of your information going to a VPN server they can't tell what it is where it's ultimately going, if it's got passwords or anything. 
And then what the VPN server does is it has a network of servers usually around the world, if not just around the country. And it sends your information from all kinds of servers to Gmail or Facebook or Twitter or whatever you're going to, or Wycliffe Associates, so that anyone trying to see where your connections are going to, they can't because it's coming from dozens or hundreds of other servers in the background. So between you and your internet provider and the VPN server, hackers, governments, internet service providers, people at the coffee shop can't see what you're doing. So that's what keeps you secure. And then the VPN server does all of the actually going out to the websites or the servers in the background. Where should you use a VPN? So again, you may have heard advertisements on your podcast or radio stations about VPNs. You definitely want to use one if you're going to do anything sensitive in a public place, like a coffee shop or a hotel or an airport or a country, again, that you don't necessarily want any entities to be watching what you're doing. And then there's another use case, which is, say you're working from home, like we all sometimes do, and you need to connect to resources mm. at Wycliffe Associates or, or whoever your employer is, you can use VPN to get on the corporate network as if you're in the building. So I use that often when I'm at home. So let's ask a little bit of a question here on the coffee shops, hotels, airports. If I go on to a Starbucks and I use their Wi-Fi and I go on my bank, okay, in my browser, the bank has HTTPS, so they're using SSL. Does it still matter? It does because you could have a bad actor sitting in the parking lot on the same Wi-Fi or in the coffee shop who has a connection between you and the bank. It's mm -hmm. called a man-in-the-middle attack. And so they can actually be your internet service provider because you think you're connecting to Starbucks, but you're actually connecting to that person's laptop and you don't even know it. And they're rerouting you up to your bank. So they're capturing all of that unencrypted information before it gets encrypted, and you have no idea that it happens. Yeah, actually, uh, we, we know anecdotally that we had one of our users who used the airport Wi-Fi in an overseas airport, <clears throat> which will remain nameless, mm -hmm. uh, and he did get man in the middle, and they were able to actually take his credentials um, and then log into our email servers and the rest of our stuff using those credentials. Thankfully, we have some things that monitor for that sort of activity, and we were able to, to catch it. Um, but yeah, it is actually it's it is actually a real problem, and so you definitely want to use a VPN when you're on any Wi-Fi where somebody else is controlling the network, not in the office, not at your home, but like any kind of a public Wi-Fi. Yeah, exactly. So, Mark, I know for some of us, you know, VPNs actually been around for a while. Right. They're big in the news right now. We hear them advertised a lot on some shows, um, but I remember back in the day when I used a VPN, it was slow. Um, and so when connecting to our network to pass files or bring files down, uh, is that an impediment anymore? Do we still have that kind of s possible slow experience? You're going to see a little bit of a performance hit, but internet connections today are so fast that it won't matter. Like the speeds we get with our VPN, you could watch 4K Netflix and still be working. Not that I recommend doing those things at the same time, but it's fast enough. I think we saw about a 15% performance hit when you and I did testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was I was impressed. I've used them for a while, and it was I didn't even notice it other than that I was tracking the numbers. I, I couldn't have told you that I slowed down at all. I was very impressed by the one we have to our network. Mm -hmm. A big improvement over what we did have previously. Yep. All right. There are a lot of retail products you can get. So if you just want to have something on your computer, your cell phone, for when you are at that coffee shop or airport or hotel, as you've probably heard on the radio, like Glenn mentioned, ExpressVPN, NordVPN, OpenVPN, these are all retail companies that sell you a VPN service, and it's about $6 a month, so it's pretty negligible. And talk to your manager that may be reimbursable if you're with WA. And I'm happy to announce that we are rolling out a brand new VPN at Wycliffe Associates. Uh, the provider is Sophos, they do our antivirus as well. So I'm gonna go through just kind of what that looks like to set up. This is not an exhaustive instruction manual, so don't think you have to write down notes. We'll send out another video later on. Um, but do email the help desk if you want this new VPN, and what it would do is give you access to our corporate network and that protection if you're at a coffee shop or another public place. So for people who have been using our VPN, the Junos Pulse based VPN, mm -hmm. not to get too technical, but part of it is that is not what's called a full tunnel. So all that VPN did was allow you access into our network so that you could access the resources. 
but the rest of your traffic wasn't affected by that, didn't get encrypted, didn't get protected by any of our other software systems. Yeah. This new one that we're using a Sophos device for, it is what's called a full tunnel. So when you get on that VPN, not only are you just like being in the office in terms of what you can access, you can even print to a printer in the office, mm. you can access uh, any of the software that we have on the servers here in the office, but also all of your traffic is encrypted mm -hmm. and also protected by the additional security software that we have in place to protect our users here in the building. Correct. Yep. Very good. That is the big difference. All right, so when you go to install this, you're going to install a product called OpenVPN Connect. It is what is on the back end of our Sophos VPN appliance, but it's also a commonly used VPN tool. So if you're on Windows, you'll download the Windows version. It also supports Mac and Linux, like some of our programmers use. You're also going to log into a web portal that we have. And so I will send out that address and in the instructions later on. But you'll use your Wycliffe login, and then you're going to download a configuration file. I have it highlighted here, the configuration file for other OSs. Once you have that, you will open up the OpenVPN client and import that file that you downloaded, and then you will be able to connect to WA. So it's pretty simple. You'll get some statistics about how much traffic you're using. And if you want for fun, before you do that, you can do a speed test and then do a speed test after like we did. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it's about a 15% performance hit, which is really good for VPN. And the important thing is all that setup you only do once. Yep. Once you do that, you follow the steps for setup, you download the client, have it installed. It's just a matter of basically hitting a button in your computer and you're on the network, your stuff is, is protected. Now let me ask you a question. Is this also going to work on our mobile devices, on our Apple phones, Android phones, things like that? Yep. The instructions will be a little bit different, but yes, we will have support for mobile devices too, which is exciting. Yeah, just a commercial for why you would care about mobile devices. Um, for any of us who travel internationally, we often don't have cell service internationally, so we're completely dependent on whatever Wi-Fi is in the airports, ca coffee shops, you know, places that we go, even even the ministries that we you know might host an event at or something like that. And you know, your phone is constantly checking your email and doing all those kinds of things, and that is all subject to credential compromise. It is encrypted between your phone and the server. But again, if you get man in the middle, in other words, if you get on some questionable Wi-Fi network where they've put up Wi-Fi access points that have been hacked, it looks like you're encrypted, but you're not. They're actually decrypting that traffic and your credentials can be taken and used. And of course, in today's world, that would be a really bad thing given the work that we do and the sensitivity of those that we serve. Mm -hmm. And again, if you would like access to our VPN, just email the help desk and we'll send you some instructions. We're not going to make it available to everybody automatically just to limit the pool of attack surface. And setting up was easy. I mean, it'll, it'll take you longer just to watch the video that Matt will send out later than it did to install, click on the configuration file, and then I was done. Yep. And you'll be able to turn it on and off. So like mm -hmm. Mark mentioned, it'll just be something in your taskbar. You open it up, hit connect, and you're good to go. All right, we're gonna switch gears back to or next to Nobi for yeah which is something that you probably all become familiar with. Maybe you're not a huge fan, but it's super important. So, Nobi four is our security provider, our security education provider. So it gives you information in a fun way. So you've probably taken training in the past, or you've already completed the 2020 training. And so, just to go over some statistics, we have phishing tests that go out all the time and we still have about 10 percent of people that click on them we're a little bit below the industry average as you can see here but that means that one out of ten times no before sends out a fake email that has a bunch of things you should recognize as being bad they're being clicked on and so some of you may have noticed that if someone clicks on an email that's a phishing test they're automatically enrolled in an additional additional 15 minute training it's so. a refresh just a refresh. Just a small refresh. It's just a bonus. Don't think of it as a timeout. Just think of it as another opportunity to learn. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So you should have gotten emails about these four 15-minute classes that are mandatory for 2020. We do this every year, and they're pretty, pretty entertaining. So let us know if you have any questions or if you haven't gotten the email. I just want to take a minute and talk about the fish run percentage that's at 10.5% for us right now. That That is pretty low. That's good. We mm -hmm. should celebrate that. Yeah. But we've got about uh, three or 400 active mailboxes in Wycliffe Associates at any given time. Mm -hmm. 
And if 10% of people are falling for a phishing attack, that's like 30 or 40 people. That's a fair number. And it really, it only takes once. It only takes once to leak your credentials or do something inadvertent, install spyware or malware on your computer. And we have stuff that tries to help protect our computers, protect the inbound mail and all of that stuff. But it really is important that we layer our security together, right? They talk about having layers of security. Mm -hmm. So sure, we've got stuff on the server. You know, we actually had to add rules to allow the phishing tests in because the, the servers do a pretty good job of catching the obvious phishing stuff and you never even see it. It just gets blocked at the at the mail server level because we use Microsoft servers. They've got millions and millions of customers. They're pretty, their AI is pretty good at catching that stuff, but they do get through from time to time. Mm -hmm. The accounting team gets phishing emails every day from one, you know, from one executive or another that says, Scott, we need you to transfer this money to this account right away. Jackson, we need you to transfer this money right away to, from here to there. And it, you know, they are very well, uh, very well educated. They know not to fall for that stuff. But we are being tried every day, and it's not just because we're a Christian nonprofit. It's actually just every business is being mm -hmm. tried right now, mm -hmm. and so it's really important that users understand they are that final layer of defense. When they take action on an email, they are, you know, protecting the organization and the ministry. So that's why we ask that you do the know before training. Like Matt said, it's it's not that bad. You know, you can take an hour out of your year, watch it, and learn some stuff. And and I'm never offended. So if I send something out and somebody goes, Glenn, did you actually mean to send me this link? Is this for real? Uh, that's totally cool. Yeah, I'm not offended by that. That you're doing your job, so that's great. Yeah. Well, actually, the funny thing is, you know, Matt, how how often do you send out a thing that is legit and says like, Hey, I need everybody. We're trying to get you know antivirus in everybody's computer. How many tickets do you get back from the help desk? And I get them too. Is this Matt guy for real? This is part of the reason we wanted to bring you in is that you can see Matt's actually real. a live person. He actually does exist. <laughs> this is Matt Gerber, but you're also welcome to always uh, email any one of us or the help desk and say, is this legit? You get a gold star for that. If you come in the office, we'll, uh, we'll buy you a soda pop or something to say thank you for doing that. Yes, if I do have to send out a company-wide communication, I always say if you need to check that this is legit, feel free to reach out to myself or Mark just to make sure. And we do get quite a few people that do that. So yeah. Well, you know, the harder you try to make it look like it's really you, the crazier you seem. So it's really, <laughs> we've created a bit of a difficult situation. But again, it's fine. We would far rather have you double check yeah. than to install something that, you know, shouldn't be there. And before we go any further, it's probably worth noting any emails that come out that are actually from us. They're not going to be from IT at Wycliffe Associates. They're not going to be from... They're going to be either from Matt, from Matt's email box, or mine, or Glenn, or Andrew Para, or one mm -hmm. of the people on our staff. Yep. We don't use, right? We don't use any kind of like generic nope. IT mailbox to send out no, messages. No, only about to stuff. receive the right. help desk yep. email address, but we don't send from that typically. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. And one other thing to mention with regard to security if you do get a man in the middle attack, so somebody gets your password, that's the reason that we rolled out MFA, or mm -hmm. multi-factor mm -hmm. authentication. So you may remember you have to have an app on your phone or get a text message or a phone call. So when you log into things, and even every so often, it'll pop up and make you do that to verify that it's you. Because if a hacker gets your password, but they don't have that pop up on your phone or the six digit code, right. it's not gonna do them any good. So that's why we rolled out MFA. Yeah, exactly. All right, phishing, just some recaps. And again, this has all gone over in the know before training. But just one thing first, not every email is a phishing email. So we still get normal spam. So you might just get emails from people trying to sell you something. Yes, that's annoying and you can put it in your spam box, but not every email is somebody trying to hack you. So just keep that in mind. But phishing emails do look like they're from a company that you would know and trust. Mm. And they often seem urgent. Mm -hmm. So again, the no before training goes over red flags, but you're not expecting it. It is from a common provider like Netflix or Adobe or Instagram that you might use. They often need you to do an action right away, like you need to reset your password or your account has been compromised, reset your password or your account expired or something. It's trying to get you to click on a link to take an action. Um, and then here's a, just an example, like say you get this email. You might have Netflix, you suddenly get this email from Netflix, oh my gosh, I need to update my account information. That's an example of a, a phishing email. And you can hover over the link just to see if it's going where it says it's going. Watch for misspelled domain names. Watch for it coming in odd times of the night. 
bad English. These are all red flags you can watch out for. Well, and it's if it is a vendor that you use like Netflix, you could just go log on to Netflix direct, right, mm-hmm. and check yes. your account. That's the best way is don't don't use the link to click through. Absolutely. Especially if it's from a bank or something. So you can email from Bank of America, click here to uh, reset your credit card because it's locked or something. Don't click the link, just go to bankofamerica.com or right. call them mm, and right. see if it's legit. Psst, Matt, what's a domain name? <laughs> <laughs> domain name is just a website, like wickliffassociates.org so is our domain name. Blah, 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 dot com. Yep, dot com, dot org is just a website. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. Great question. So, as I was preparing for this, I came across this blurb up here, which struck me a lot. So I'm just going to read it because it's pretty eye-opening. So last year, this company, Cybersecurity Ventures, predicted that cybercrime will cost the world six trillion dollars annually by 2021, up from three trillion in 2015. This represents the greatest transfer of economic wealth in history risks, incentives for innovation and investment, and will be more profitable than the global trade of all major illegal drugs combined. Wow. So it is a big industry, it's a big deal. And some high profile stories you might have heard, almost certainly heard in the news. John Podesta's emails from the 2016 presidential race, that possibly affected the election because he clicked on a phishing email mm. and his Gmail got hacked. Wow. And all of those WikiLeaks emails came out. That was from a phishing attempt. Wow. Three billion Yahoo users' accounts have been hacked. Um, Equifax in 2017 had 145 million customers' information hacked. You've heard of ransomware, where a bunch of computers at a company get locked and they have to pay a Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency to unlock their files. That even happens to hospitals, to like small municipalities. And so, what do you do? Do you pay it? Well, sometimes they do because they need their files back, but that's a lot of money and it's kind of a moral dilemma too because you don't want to encourage hackers by rewarding it but yeah right and there's even legislation i think being proposed to to make the act of paying that ransom something that is illegal yeah it's problematic because you're you're often offshoring funds to question questionable countries which may actually create a crime for you so yeah don't do it it's bad ransomware is bad garmin our friends at garmin learned this lesson a few months ago very painfully yeah Oh, just uh, an item of business, if I may. So um, if you're a familiar watcher of Showcase, you know we also are running the Q&A channel. So if any of these terms or any questions are popping in your mind, feel free to slide them into the Q&A channel, um, and we'll answer them after, I think, probably we talk about what you need to do next. Yeah, absolutely. Let us know if you have any questions. Um, And then some other ones that were in the news, Home Depot. I personally got affected by that. They came out and said, hey, we had our cash registers hacked and Mm -hmm. I had noticed some bad transactions on my bank, so I had to get a new debit card. Mm. And then Target. Now, I know a little bit about Target because at a couple of previous jobs ago, the CIO came from Target, and so he shared what happened exactly, and it's already in the public, so I'm not sharing anything that I shouldn't be, but some somebody had passwords in SharePoint. I don't know if it was a Word document or Excel file. (laughs) But a vendor of Target got access to their network and was able to find that file just presumably by searching passwords or something in SharePoint. And then they were able to put a little virus in all of the cash registers that just watched everyone's credit card numbers go by. Wow. So It was a bad scene. Yeah. So that brings me to the next part. What can you do? And one of the things is don't store your passwords in Notepad or Excel (laughs) because... It's not encrypted. It's very easy to just grab. If someone gets onto your computer, it's not a good idea. Right. Another thing is try not to reuse the same password. Let's say that you use whatever password it is on every website. Well, then if one of them gets hacked, they can just try that on all the common websites. So say it's your Facebook password and that gets hacked. They can try it on LinkedIn. They can try it on your banking website. They can try it on right. your email. So try to use different passwords for everything. Um, We use a software called LastPass within IT, and so you have to know one master password, and then that stores all of your passwords in an encrypted file. And that's free for home users too, so you can do LastPass, you can use the iCloud keychain if you're an Apple user. There are lots of secure password storage applications, so I'd highly recommend 
using one of those for you and your family. Now, Matt, let's take a second here because you just said, hey, don't store all your passwords behind one password. And then you said you should store all your passwords behind one password. Mm -hmm. So what would make LastPass safer than like taking a Word document, for instance, putting them all in there and maybe just doing Word encryption? Yeah. So LastPass is super secure and encrypted. It's when you're entering your password, you're just talking to LastPass servers rather than dozens of other websites that you might visit. So they don't even have the ability to get your passwords. So like if you forget your master password, they can't even reset it for you and get at it. So there's lots of encryption in the background. You can even have it just on your device. So it's not even in the internet. Also notable that LastPass supports MFA, yep. which is how I use it. And I think our whole team uses it with MFA. I enforce that as a policy. So I do need to have my master password, but I also have to have MFA, which I use the authenticator on my phone. Mm -hmm. And I also use my thumbprint on my phone so that I don't have to MFA. You know, I, I do I have to MFA once every 60 days. But mm -hmm. yeah, so it, I, that's always the first question people ask me is, isn't that less secure? Now I only have, you know, it's like you unlock the front door of the house, you can steal the whole house. Yeah, there's more to it than that that makes it mm -hmm. that makes it a good pick. And it also makes it much more likely that you will have unique passwords for each website. Let's be realistic. It's really hard to have 20, 30, 50, 100 passwords mm -hmm. if you don't use a password manager. Yep. So my LastPass vault has, I think, more than 500 logins in it. And I know that may be a little bit high, but every website I go to, I'm able to create a unique set of credentials. LastPass takes care of that, stores them away. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, I don't ever need to know what they are. It's long, it's ugly, and all that stuff. If you're, it's there. Yeah, if you're logged into LastPass, it's just another app on your device. It really does. We made it, I think, sound very complicated. It's not. But it does all the suggestion. It knows where you are. It says, hey, by the way, this is what you've got. Let me. Would you want me to put it in there? And you can let it in. So I don't I don't, don't have to remember any of those passwords. They're all unique, just like Mark said. Um, and it's different than the password managers that you have in your browser mm -hmm. because it doesn't... Yeah. <clears throat> it stays with uh, you know wherever I am logged into LastPass, not right. just a particular browser. So it's actually easier and more secure than doing that. So while Chrome or Firefox or any of those suggest, or even Edge, uh, the password manager, we highly recommend LastPass over that. Yeah, it's, it's funny. LastPass, when you install it in your browser, it says, do you want me to import your passwords? And then it will show you the decrypted list of all the passwords that you have stored, even in Chrome, unless you've turned on uh, salted hash for your for your passwords. Mm. It's it's eye opening when you realize, oh, this little piece of software just decrypted all those passwords. Anyone could have got that if had the access. Yes, yeah, it's bad mm -hmm. news. One other note about LastPass. Matt said, you know, if you if you lose your master password, they can't decrypt it. Well, that sounds kind of horrifying to me. LastPass actually has a way for you to designate a friend or several friends mm -hmm. as a backup. So, in, for instance, my wife's email is my backup, so that if I completely forget my master password, which by the way, my wife and I share that master password, but I have other people as well on my friend list. They can actually send an email to somebody that I've already pre-designated who's agreed. And Glenn can say, yeah, Mark actually did lose his password. I approve, like I've talked to Mark and he's told me that he lost it. And then he can basically, your friend can help you get it unlocked. So all will not be lost. They've thought this through fairly well. Um, it's a very low price to pay for something that really does improve your digital security. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One other thing is to make sure you have antivirus. We roll out Sophos here for all of our corporate connected devices. The devices that just connect to Office 365 that have never been in our building. Um, we have Andrew, one of our employees, working with those users to get Sophos on their laptop. So you may get an email from Andrew if you haven't already. Feel free to work with him. We have the licenses. We'd be happy to get Sophos on your computer. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned, use a VPN. Including ours. Including ours. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, but the main message is you are the most important line of defense against cybercrime. We can have all the right firewall rules and antiviruses and do everything right on my team's end, but you're the only one that can watch out for those emails, those phishing emails, or even text messages or phone calls that are suspicious. So please do your part in protecting your username and password. So just to wrap up, Matt, mm -hmm. um, we've talked about VPN. WA now has a free VPN that you can use if you want to have a full tunnel. We would say probably that's best for if you're in the States. If you're overseas, you probably don't want to have to route your packets all the way back across the ocean to here. Yep. That's if you're in the States, case for ExpressVPN or NordVPN or right. something else. So we'll yep. get to that in a second. If you're in the States and you're interested in that, the best way to reach out to you is... Email the help desk. Email the say help desk like and say, VPN. yep, I want to get signed up for VPN. Um, like 
Glenn said, you can sign up for one of the commercial ones. As far as I know, WA will be happy to pay for that. It's, they're usually like six bucks a month. You can either put it on your WA credit card if you have it. Just check with your supervisor, but typically we are happy to you know, go ahead and reimburse you for that and whatnot. Uh, for traveling, that may be a better idea because the big VPNs are going to have a point of presence all over the world, mm -hmm. so those packets aren't coming literally across the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, they will come across the ocean. Just it actually, it actually takes some time, and it will it will affect your experience. So, and they may not want whoever is watching to know that they're talking to Wycliffe Associates. Right. So that would be the other reason that you uh, want to be thoughtful. If you for, if if that's a concern for you, then go ahead and get yourself onto Express or Nord or any. Just pick a VPN provider that has good reviews, and yep. and you should be fine with that. So if they have any questions about phishing emails, things like that, same thing. Email the help desk. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, any anything else? Any parting thoughts before we wrap up and do Q and A? We're going to actually take Q and A here in a minute. So now's your chance. Get your get your questions. I don't know if Craig has any. Craig, I forgot to bring. Yeah, yeah. Put it in here. Put it on the software showcase channel because I forgot to bring my laptop in. Actually, I didn't forget to bring it. I just thought I'm going to well, bring I've, either the coffee or the laptop this week, so I went with. Coffee. While you're doing, I have one more last pass anecdote. Oh yeah, let's hear it. Go for so, it. So uh, another thing that's kind of cool too is you know thinking about um, you know I'm feeling healthy today and all that kind of fun stuff. But in terms of planning of the last pass stuff, they also have the ability to appoint somebody. Uh, to kind of inherit your account. Mm. So if something should happen to me, then uh, my wife has access to all the, the key passwords, you know, for banking or whatever, um, so they're not at a loss. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have full access yeah. to that. So yeah. that gives me some peace of mind. I really appreciate having that feature as well. Yeah, I don't know what you and Mary Ellen do, but Angie and I actually share one account. So we, mm -hmm. we have it both on our phones and our laptops and stuff like that. So we have, you know, if I set up our banking password, then she has it and there's not any of that other stuff. But because we also use it at work, and I don't want my work passwords in there, and she doesn't want to see those, LastPass even offers a way for us, we as a team, share passwords, and we have a corporate, and then I can also link in my personal one. Mm -hmm. It's gotten really good. It's it's way better than it was four or five years ago when it was kind of a rough and difficult pain in the neck. Mm -hmm. It's it's pretty smart now, and it, it when I create an account, it'll see, oh, you used your personal email address when you made that account, and it'll put it in the personal so that we have access to it as a family. Or it'll see, oh, you used your Wycliffe Associates account. It'll put it in my work account. And then if I need to give it to these guys, I can just basically say, yeah, I want Glenn to have this one too. I can just share that to Glenn and then you know we may have a, an account. And I never even it. need to know the password. In fact, right. I might not even see it. Right. I just have access to the ability to share. You can log in with it and yep. stuff like that. So anyway, obviously we're fans for what it costs. It's well worth what we pay for. Yeah. Should we so. see if we have any questions? Yeah, we do have one. Do people know right away if they fail one of WA's phishing tests? Yeah, we actually send Matt to your house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, when do they find out? You'll find out when you get a random 15-minute training assignment from Nova 4, mm. separate from the four that we assign yearly. Yeah. So if you get that, it means that you clicked on one of the phishing emails. And if you're curious which one it was, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to dig into that and share which one it was. Yeah, I think you actually, when you click on the link, it, it goes to a no before page that kind of tells you that you shouldn't have fallen. It's like that. bowling. You know right away. Oh, yep. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I shouldn't have done that. No, you do know right away. Um, and the 15 minutes is just a refresher for you. We really want to get that 10% down. You know, mm -hmm. again, that's it's important. Um, any other questions coming in? Okay, we're getting a goose egg from, from Craig. Well, Matt, it's been really good to have you here. Uh, if you're watching this on the live stream, great. Thanks for joining us today. We will post this video to YouTube later. If you have watched this far and you're on YouTube, please take a moment to like and subscribe. <laughs> um, big YouTube channels have like millions and millions of users uh, that are subscribed. I think we were at 52 the last time I looked, so we've got a little ways to go. But there are actually some good things that happen for our channel when we hit 100. Mm. So this is me begging you to please subscribe to our channel so we can get to 100. The important thing is it actually lets us get our own YouTube link instead of it being like YouTube slash a long trail of numbers and letters. Anyway, all we have to do is have 100 people. That would be very cool. So please like and subscribe. And actually, if you have any comments on the YouTube video, you're welcome to put them there. We actually get notified if comments go up and we can respond to them there. And you can always email the help desk. Uh, probably not worth your time to put a comment on YouTube about how to get signed up for VPN. We may not respond <laughs> to that one, but we do appreciate the we do appreciate the positive accolades, and uh, we very much appreciate Matt and the work that he does in security. Um, this falls, I think, under the umbrella of if you do your job right, everybody just takes you for granted. And I want you to know, I don't take you for granted. I appreciate Thanks. the work that you do in protecting our organization. There's a lot more that goes on that we just haven't touched on today. We've got a, a really good security consultant who mm -hmm. helps us monitor a lot of things. We've got. 
uh, Joy Vutcherbeck, who works in the field area, tracks the movements of people all around the world. And you might have asked yourself, man, why do we bother doing that? We actually get alerted when people travel to unusual places. And this year it's been a little quiet, but typically it's hopping. We mm -hmm. get all kinds of alerts. If it says, you know, Glenn's usually in the U.S., but he just popped up in, you know, this corner of Africa. You should check and make sure he's there. Yeah, I'm not there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's that how we know something's gone wrong. So we have, there's a lot of things going on. You know, we're, we're trying to apply our layers and you guys as users are an important part of that as well. Thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah great. Thanks for being um, here. Next time when we come back, uh, you've heard us refer to Craig, who is our man behind the curtain, but not next time. We're bringing him in front of the camera and we'll talk more about what he has to show there. Yeah, we've got kind of a roundup of a bunch of uh, important, but small changes around the whole portfolio of things that we're really excited to get rolled out. So in the meanwhile, Keep working hard at what you're doing, and uh, we'll see you next time.